Will Donald Trump defy the odds again, like in 2016, when the polls got it oh so wrong? Two weeks ahead of the U.S. midterm elections, the president has honed a simple narrative that foreigners and sometimes feminists are coming to get you. First, the foreigners. He's feeling scrutiny over his support for a Saudi regime that's now partially owned up to the brutal murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Trump changing the conversation with accusations that the Democrats are egging on the latest migrant caravan that's heading north from uh, Central America, the U.S. president threatening uh, to uh, pull aid for El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala and to send troops to the Mexican border. We'll examine the root causes and the timing of the crisis. Then there's the energizing of Trump's base after the recent confirmation hearings for his new Supreme Court justice. Brett Kavanaugh's defense against sexual violence may have appalled domestic abuse victims, but it galvanized those won over by the witch hunt argument. Democrats have outspent Republicans and seem more motivated to vote. But bear in mind, historically, these are midterms we're talking about, and historically, turnout is low. The most motivated will be the ones who vote. Will the president's nativist appeal be enough to bring a, enough of his hardcore base to the polls? Today in the France 24 debate, we are looking at that nativist instinct. And uh, joining us uh, for this discussion uh, from Utica, New York, pollster John Zogby, founder of Zogby Strategies. We're also joined uh, from Houston, Texas, by uh, Antonio Ariano. He is uh, with uh, the uh, Latina uh, gr grassroots activist uh, group uh, Jolt Texas. Thanks for being with us. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Hello. Twitter, Thank the you. hashtag F24Debate. Let's start with the latest. Donald Trump vowing to punish Central American states over that migrant caravan, that caravan which has now crossed over from Guatemala into Mexico. France 24 correspondent Natasha Pizze has more. As you can see, thousands of them just camped out in the main square of Tapatula, this town that's 38 kilometers from the border with Mexico where they came in from Guatemala. And yesterday they walked those 38 kilometers in 40 degree heat, baking sun. There are many toddlers, people were walking, carrying their children, uh, carrying their, you know, all the belongings they could bring on their head. Um, and they've had this awful night out here. Many of them are sick, their, their feet are swollen and sore from yesterday. Um, there's talk of them continuing today, uh, but it's a bit unclear. I mean, that's one of the things that just happens with having this many people trying to move together. It's that logistically it is incredibly complicated to, to organize, to keep them together, to keep them safe, to get them food. Like, no humanitarian organization can really cope with this right now. Um, they've got 3,000 kilometers still ahead of them to reach uh, the U.S. border, which for many of them um, is, is where they're determined to get to, no matter what Donald Trump says. And we're joined as well by sociologist James Cohn, who teaches at the uh, University of Paris, Sorbonne Nouvelle, and is the author uh, of uh, In the Pursuit of Illegals, Politics and Anti-Immigrant Movements in the United States, published in French. That's right. Uh, uh, James Cohen, your uh, reaction to the latest news we're getting about that migrant caravan, more than 7,000 people are in it, according to uh, UN statistics. It's, uh, it's heading north. Donald Trump has seized upon this issue. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, Donald Trump was going to seize upon that issue because what he's been doing since the very since day one of his campaign in 2015 is to criminalize migrants, criminalize people who are in desperate situations. And of all places where people are in desperate, desperate situations in great numbers, uh, we need to look at the place where they're coming from now, which is the, the, the three countries in the north of Central uh, Amer America, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the so-called Northern Triangle of Central America, uh, which um, uh, wh whose migrants Trump designates as a threat. And he paints them all as criminals, and uh, he doesn't he want to. He calls it a them. national emergency. Is it a national emergency? No, it's an invented emergency. There are ways of uh, absorbing these migrants and finding humanitarian, you know, human ways of, of dealing with their needs, uh, one of which would be to help develop their countries. 
and uh, mm-hmm. this threat to, to cut off aid, uh, and that is the, the, the latest, uh, Donald Trump vowing to punish uh, Central American states uh, uh, over that migrant caravan. Um, he uh, is uh, saying that um, uh, they're not stopping people from leaving their country and coming uh, uh, over illegally to the U.S., these countries have been punished for a long time, and the United States has some responsibility in the punishing situation of these countries. The people who live there now are, m- many of them are leaving in droves because of the physical danger that they, that they, that they live in. It's not just poverty, it's also a physical danger. There's, there are endemic forms of violence, some of which were transmitted to these si- societies via the United States, via youth gangs whose members were deported back to countries where they'd bar- barely ever lived before, uh, in particular El Salvador. Uh, and so uh, the United States uh, needs to recognize its role in this, but Trump is doing quite the opposite. All right. Uh, before we go to the rest of our panel, I want to say hello to uh, joining us from Columbus, Ohio, Republican strategist uh, Jay Chabria. Thank you for being with us. Um, I, I want to begin with John Zogby. Uh, if I was being callous and cynical... Uh, would it, would it be uh, would Donald Trump be saying that this is heaven sent? The fact that you have this caravan of migrants heading north uh, two weeks before a midterm election. For someone like Donald Trump, uh, who is callous and cynical himself, um, this is manna from heaven, because what it does is. It nationalizes the issue of immigration even more than it already was. You know, strangely, you have congressional districts all over the United States where immigration is barely an an issue at all, and yet the Republican candidates are playing off of that issue as a national security threat. Now, in addition to the millions of dollars being spent on paid advertising on immigration, you now have the, the daily news cycle being fed what what is purported to be swarms of, of, of immigrants coming in and invading, even attacking our values. This is made to order for, for Trump, and I wouldn't deny its efficacy one bit. Its efficacy uh, one bit. Uh, are you feeling it where you are, uh, Antonio Arroyo, in, in um in Houston, Texas, uh, where Donald Trump uh, was, was to speak later in the company of uh, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz at a campaign event. You know, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to amplify the voice of Latinos here, the demographic that is soon to be the majority of the state in Texas. This is very much our fight. It's happening at the border between Mexico and Texas, and that's where this caravan seems to be leading towards. Um, What we need to understand is that here in the Lone Star State, uh, statistics show that uh, 62% of Latinos are either immigrants or children of immigrants. So these people are our family members. They're people that identify with our culture, and we cannot continue to attack, criminalize, and fear people that are seeking asylum in this country. America is built up on um, the values of hope and the opportunity for all. And I think that we have gotten so distracted with such a negative rhetoric coming from the White House of the United States that many of us would have never even imagined could have been possible in a post-civil uh, civil rights era. But here we are. So it's imperative that now, more than ever before, mobilize and organize, make sure that we protect, provide a, a, a pathway to citizenship in, in America that is viable, as well as protect and uh, uh, give uh, uh, asylum to those who seek asylum from gang violence, from drugs, and and, and, and other uh, economic limitations that have been put upon them. I think it's imperative that we mobilize and, and help amplify, not target or make them um, pawns in a political game um, this close to the midterm election. But you, you're, you're very right. I think it'll make a big difference. Um, President Trump said that this would be the, the election of Kavanaugh and the caravan. And I think it's, it's true. I think that people will mobilize and see that this midterm election in America is a, an election that will dictate not just who wins, uh, what political party wins, where the soul of this country stands. Jay Chabria, you agree that it is all about the caravan and Kavanaugh in this election? Well, 
I think the election is on more than just those two issues. I mean, health care, it polls the highest right now in America. It was like a moving voters, big state But I think immigration plays a pretty big thing thanks to the Republican and the Republican base, and some Republican women have the swing vote here. We're talking about security, which women have a you know, very you know, big interest in. We're talking about economic security. Uh, Jay, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt you. I'm going to have to interrupt you. We're going to we're going to have to call you back because we're going to have to call you back because we're having issues with the sound. Apologies for that. We'll get we'll get back to you uh, uh, right away. Uh, you were mentioning, uh, from what I heard there, uh, the polling that it isn't just uh, about those two issues. But again, John Zogby, you said this is a, a the fact that Donald Trump has been able to make this immigration issue a national issue. Is that unprecedented in the United States? You mean for immigration? No, it was made a national issue in 2006 in the congressional elections, and it backfired dramatically on Republicans. The difficulty today is that we don't have political parties that try to grab the middle ground and try to persuade the undecideds with you know a positive message of hope instead the republicans have have carved out for themselves even more than the economic boom that this country is facing and that's a real issue that republicans could run on instead what they are carving out for themselves is the threat to national security and also that they are very much in the corner of being the white man's party uh, that's what they were and what uh, rode Donald Trump to uh, to victory in 2016, and they're going to go with that winning formula, uh, quote unquote, winning formula, based on the uh, the Kavanaugh issue. But in 2016, uh, people were saying, "Yeah, where's where's Donald Trump going to then pick up independent voters? Uh, uh, can he really just afford to just energize the base?" Again, these are midterm elections, John. Uh, the last time more than 50 percent of the population voted in midterm elections in the U.S. was 1914. So is it really all Donald Trump has to do is uh, energize enough of his base? It could be. And this is uh, and this is a question for Antonio. Uh, one of the things that we're tracking very closely is the fact that there is not the level of enthusiasm among Hispanic voters that we thought that there was going to be. Um, and they are critical to a Democratic victory. Half the competitive seats currently held by Republicans now are in districts where the, the electorate is about 20 percent uh, Latino. And so in that sense, what we're seeing among uh, uh, Latino Hispanic voters, number one, more of them are saying, I'm doing better off economically than I was a few years ago. That may dampen uh, turnout to vote against uh, the, the status quo. The other is that there are uh, Hispanic voters who are genuinely afraid that they're going to be watched, that they're going to be tracked, that they're going to lose either their own uh, residency in the United States or that of a family member or friend. And so I'm watching the, the Latino, the Hispanic vote very, very closely. Antonio Ariano, uh, just before the 2016 election, the France 24 debate went to uh, the suburbs of Washington and Virginia and met with uh, Hispanic voters, some of whom said they were ready to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, what are your thoughts listening to what John Zogby just said? So here, here's the truth. The fact is that um, Latinos... Uh, have a generational gap. What's occurring is that we see older Latinos uh, identify with the conservative values of a Republican Party, especially Catholic Latinos um, tend to identify with a um, uh, anti-LGBTQ uh, platform, uh, which is Republican, and anti-abortion um, uh, uh, or women's rights to choose platform, which is Republican. But what we're seeing now in our recent study, We Are Texas, that we just released last Wednesday at the Texas Capitol, is Latinos young Latinos between the ages of 18 to 25 are increasingly progressive. And that's very, very, very much uh, absent from the national narrative. We need to acknowledge that. Latinos are seeking a positive message, and not just a message of vote for the Democratic Party, otherwise you get 
you know, four more years of the Trump uh, um, so, uh, agenda. So it, more, that, that more, matter. more progressive. Sure so more platform. progressive, uh, more, more progressive, Antonio. But are they more energized? Yes, they're becoming increasingly more energized, but at the same time, there's a lack of investment. Both political parties have dropped the ball. There is not an investment as heavily as it needs to be, especially here in Texas, to reach out to Latino voters in the way that they need to be reached out to. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party need to stop looking at Latinos as a given entity and look at them as a constituency that needs recruitment. That's not occurring. And we need to make sure that these political parties are doing the hard work of really reaching out and innovating their, their approach to civic engagement in order to mobilize a new demographic of Latinos that haven't participated or have been disenfranchised from the political party. James Cohn. Well, uh, I can only agree. Uh, I, I think that the, the Republicans in particular have sort of painted themselves into a corner in the past uh, several years. And, and, and although they won a lucky one with Trump, uh, demographically, uh, things are not going in their direction. Because if they continue to insist, as Mr. Zogby was saying a few minutes ago, uh, on being the white people's party uh, and really uh, moving, and pick, you know, Occupying the space of an ethno-nationalist white movement, uh, in, in that case, they're going to be losing support from Latinos for, 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 for quite a while, and um, that should make some uh, Republicans, especially in Texas, thinking hard, uh, think hard. But uh, as I see right now, at the moment, in Texas, uh, there is a rival to Senator Ted Cruz, a, a very far right-wing Republican uh, named Beto O'Rourke, a, a Democratic candidate who's giving uh, uh, Cruz a run for his money. All right, but we'll see how we'll see how it plays out. Uh, we have the connection back with Columbus, Ohio. Jay Shabria, apologies again for uh, for the for the no te problem. technical issues there. Uh, you, you're very far from the Texas border. Uh, these immigration issues do they matter in Ohio? They very much matter, especially amongst rural uh, Americans and also folks that are concerned about their economic security and their security. We, it, I live in Ohio, and our uh, Hispanic population is less than five percent. But these are still things that matter greatly. And in polling, you see the polls about a third in the, in, the, in the polls. Look, here's what I would say, and I'm, I'm hearing a lot of uh, rhetoric from the left about how uh, there's going to be a white nationalist party. There's no doubt that the president has used rhetoric, extreme rhetoric, to stir up his base. But what the Democrats have to realize is if they gain control of Congress, they better have answers to some of these questions that have vexed Americans for generations. A lot of Americans, especially in middle America, have seen um, uh, Donald Trump actually do something. They may not agree with some of the policies, we'll but they've that. seen him actually do something on immigration. And Democrats better be able to respond to that and better, better be able to uh, message to middle America. Otherwise, they're going to uh, 2020 is going to be a long election for them. All right. We'll pick up on that point, Jay. When we come back, uh, we have to take a very quick break. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're two weeks out from the U.S. midterm elections and uh, the U.S. President Donald Trump on the campaign trail this Monday in Houston alongside uh, Ted Cruz, one of his former rivals in 2016. This as uh, Trump presses the point when it comes to that caravan migrant making its way north through Central America. We're talking about it with sociologist uh, James Cohen, who teaches at the Sorbonne, the author in French of At the Pursuit of Illegals, the politics and movements, the anti-immigrant anti movements in the United States. Uh, from uh, Columbus, Ohio, Republican strategist Jay Chabria, uh, former uh, senior advisor for Ohio Governor uh, John Kasich. From Utica, New York, pollster John Zogby, founder of Zogby Strategies, and Antonio Ariano, who is with us from Houston, Texas, and is with uh, Jolt Texas, the Latino grassroots uh, movement. Uh, for our worldwide audience, those elections, by the way, those midterm elections in the U.S., which we'll be covering here, they're on November 6th. However, uh, the U.S. has something called early voting. Uh, this Monday marked the start of early voting in many counties in Florida, early voting uh, to boost uh, turnout. Uh, John Zogby, uh, all sorts of strategies in America these days to get people to vote, do they work? Yeah, they sure do. Um, in fact, just as you mentioned the uh, early voting here in the United States, the first reports that are coming out are of a substantially higher turnout than normal. 
which uh, and, and we see that in particular in the state of Nevada, which is a, a, a swing state and a very important Republican-held Senate seat in, in that state. That bodes well for the Democrats. But I'll tell you, back in 2010, which was a disastrous year for the, the Democrats, there were three states, Colorado, Nevada, and California, where a heavy investment in getting out the Latino vote in those three states produced a margin of victory for Democrats. And so get out the vote efforts are absolutely essential, especially in off-year elections where turnouts are normally low. Antonio Ariano, what's it, what's it looking like in Texas right now? You know, we've knocked on over 30,000 doors. We're really trying to make sure that Latinos are culturally represented in politics. We need them to see themselves and identify themselves with the political culture here in the United States. Um, Latinos are on, on track, to, like I said, to be the largest demographic in the Lone Star State. We have the opportunity to not just dictate who wins this election, but decide what are the legislative agenda items that we push forward. And it's imperative that young Latinos mobilize and organize. And I think that Given the current political climate, they realize that now it's on us, and we are going to make sure that we are at the forefront of this fight, bringing the change to this country. And let's not let's not mistake what's happening in regards to immigration with um, and, and pretend that it's not racial. This is completely racial. If this was happening in Canada, in our Canadian border, it, it, we wouldn't see children in cages. Um, this is happening at the United States southern border and dealing with Latin American people in which have been oppressed and continue to be oppressed even more now under Trump's administration. What we're seeing now at our border in, in the south side of Texas is a human rights violation. And it should not just affect American citizens, it should be a global uh, alert. People from around the world should look to America and ask why. Why are we allowing America to treat people of color this way? Uh, I just want to point out, Jay, Jay Shabri, I want to ask you, is something really fundamental changing in the United mm -hmm. States? Your, your, uh, your governor is uh, from the moderate wing uh, of the Republican Party. When you see uh, Donald Trump tweeting like he did earlier today, the unsubstantiated claim that criminals and, quote, unknown Middle Easterners are inside of that migrant uh, caravan, adding it's a national emergency, uh, is is. is I mean, the the the, un, the unknown Middle Easterners. I guess the ins, an insinuation that somehow terrorists are inside of that caravan, and that uh, radical Islamists uh, is is that something that's um, the new normal? Look, I, I think immigration has that that both failed. Their immigration in America has changed, and the policy will change. The problem that I see is the rhetoric on both sides, and your guess that you just have there too, where, when he's t talking about the, it's all racial. Look, there's some terrible policies that happen on the southern border that I don't support, but there are real questions about fairness, security, and economic security that need to be addressed. And when you have the president tweeting like he does, and you've got uh, charts on the other side. The real policy questions about where immigration should go can't be solved. And that's going to be the question that America is going to face for the next uh, 10 years. But there's no doubt about it. Immigration has changed, and, and it probably should change. Do we want a country with open borders? Do we want a country that, that's bringing in the best and brightest? Those are quest policy questions we should be debating. And uh, but, but, but I would say, yes, it has changed. It's not going to be the same country we were five years ago, even 10 years ago. But uh, that unsubstantiated claim that there are criminals uh, and unknown Middle Easterners. What's your reaction to it? Well, I mean, it, this is something that the president's been doing since he ran for the first time around, right? So this is not anything new to any of us. Um, we can call him out on it, and we should. We should stick to the facts. But there are real concerns, and that's what we should be addressing, the real concerns that Middle Americans have about what's going on in immigration. It's something that's on top of mind for a lot of people, and our leaders need to address them. And the Democrats have to do a better job as well. Uh, Jay Chabria, the, the U.S. president on the campaign trail uh, was brutal to uh, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, uh, calling him lying Ted all the time. And uh, tonight uh, at that rally in Houston, it looks like Cruz needs Donald Trump to galvanize support. What does that tell you about the direction of the Republican Party? Well, the Republican Party, both parties, look, I would say this too. Both parties have changed completely, and both parties will look very different 10 years uh, from what they are now. Uh, this is absolutely Trump's party at this point, but you need both 
wings, moderate wings, uh, traditional conservative wings, and also the Trump folks to get out the vote in order to win elections. That's what you're seeing tonight, where uh, Ted Cruz does, definitely needs a president. John Zogby, you agree that you need all the different wings of a party? Yeah, absolutely, you do. And I mean, to, and to some degree, the Republicans are are going into this election as as the Trump party, uh, something where he he has ninety percent support, um, and uh, those within the Republican Party who are opposing him are doing so very gingerly. But I want to respond um, on the issue of immigration for a second, and, and that is that um, uh, th th in the broad view, this is what we have coming from the Republican Party is a dinosaur's belch, kind of like uh, the, the, the last ditch effort to preserve um, an all white traditionally conservative America that uh, is no longer going to exist, period. Um, demographics are against that. Uh, and, and, and broadly speaking, across the globe, immigration is the story of humanity, and you're just not going to stop it. It's not only folks in Central America who are going to push up and try to get into the United States. It's Africa, projected to have, what, 1.6 billion people over the next 20 years. You're just not going to stop this flow. What we ought to be doing is figuring out ways that people and productivity can be utilized, not how you build temporary walls and fences that are, are frankly just going to be mowed down. Lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate, including this one from Nan. I remember a time when the Republicans had optimism to sell. Now it's all fear mongering, nativism and racism. Uh, shame. Uh, James Cohen, uh, the uh, the um, as you heard Jay Chabria mention, it's both sides that are employing negative, uh, a negative message. Historically, if you trace this back, <clears throat> I think you can trace it back conveniently to the early 90s when you had people like Newt Gingrich, uh, a very militant Republican, uh, right-wing neoliberal type in, in, in the House who, who had important functions in the House and who uh, changed the game in, in not just him, but a generation of uh, Republicans who were really um, figuring out how to best polarize and, and, and paint the Democrats as absolute. And, which and, reflected, and, you're a sociologist, which reflected perhaps a change in the United States, the, uh, a change in, 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 in Well, I think that country. some of the energy from that polarization came indeed from the reaction to the civil rights movement, uh, quite simply because the Republicans uh, very quickly afterwards, in fact, during the civil rights movement, in, in, as early as 1964, uh, even before Nixon, were running after the, the white vote in the South and trying to polarize the situation. And we've been in that wave of polarization, and it's been getting worse. Ever since and Trump is surfing on it. It's, it's, it's really uh, pretty tragic. All right. Uh, e e <laughs> Jay Chabria. Look, you know, here's the thing. It's, it, I, you've got one guest that's, that's blaming everything on the Republicans from all the way back to the start of the Republican Party. I think that's laughable. I mean, you've got many, many, many examples of Democrats doing the same thing. They do it all the time. Uh, I, I've seen it here. The Republicans do it when they, when they talk about uh, voter fraud, and, and Democrats do it when they talk about Did I say I'm a Democrat? Uh, no, I didn't say you were, but you're blaming the Republican Party for, for all the ills of America, and I think that's kind of laughable. Look, certainly our, my party has a lot of problems today, and there are a lot of things I don't stand for that, that, that are going on right now. But the Democrats are as broken uh, a party as anyone, and that's, that's happened for a long time. And it's not just Newt's fault. It's not just it, the, the Clinton had, they had a smear machine for, for all the 90s, and they continue to do that, too. So please, I, I think that's, that's a little bit laughable on your part. Jay Chabria, last month, uh, everybody here in France and I suppose in a lot of no. countries were, were captivated by uh, the, uh, those hearings uh, that took place before the U.S. Senate. And after they were finished, those Brett Kavanaugh hearings uh, uh, with uh, uh, the woman who accused him uh, of impropriety when they were in high school, people here thought, oh, that's it. This nomination is over. Yeah. They weren't expecting it to actually help Donald Trump in the polls, which it has. What's, what's, what's going on in the U.S.? Well, well, there's a question if it has and how long that Kavanaugh bump is going to be sustained. But certainly what it's done is it's hardened men 
uh, for the president and to harden women against the president. But here's what I'll say. There was a piece written today in the, in the Weekly Standard, which I'd encourage your viewers to read. Stephen Hayes wrote it. And it talks about President Clinton and his infidelities and the things that he did um, way back in the 90s and, and everything that, if they were examined, the Me Too movement may have been really, uh, he would have been, he would not be the statesman that he would be, that he was at that time. There are a lot of Republicans out there that say there's a double standard in the media. People, if you're a liberal, if you're a senior liberal uh, leader, you're going to be getting a pass from the media, from Didn't the establishment. Happen. And if you're a conservative, that's not going to happen. And they point to the president, President Clinton, as uh, occupying the White House, even though he probably had things that were far worse than what Kavanaugh did, that were documented. And, and Stephen Kavanaugh, uh, when, when there was less documentation, was uh, raked over the coals for us. That's what's going on a little bit there in the polling. Antonio Ariano, uh, the United States is not the only place which is uh, gearing up for uh, for elections. Uh, the whole world is watching uh, what's going to happen in next Sunday's runoff in Brazil, where the far right uh, candidate uh, Jair Bolsonaro is uh, is poised to win. And a lot of people wondering what's going on, not just in the United States, but across the Americas right now. Yeah, you know, it's, it's absolutely uh, something that's startling to a lot of people. And we can trace it all back to the Brexit um, uh, phenomenon that happened as well. But I mean, we have got to realize that at some point, countries have got to come together and come to a consensus about the future and collective future of this country. A lot of these uh, right-sided ideas are going to, going to only perpetuate um, harm to our planet in regards to like global warming issues and stances that these countries are going to take. And, and so much, so much more. I think also I would like to touch really quick on, on your commentator who said that it's laughable that people um, are blaming the Republican Party. I don't think it's laughable. I mean, under this administration is that we have seen some of the most uh, recent human rights uh, um, attacks on, on, on both American citizens and non-American citizens that has ever happened in, in, in modern times. And so it's under the Republican administration that we have seen a Supreme Court justice who was accused of sexual harassment and, um, take office. It's under the Republican administration that we have seen uh, underage children separated from their families. It's under this administration that we have seen a, uh, our country uh, uh, um, uh, take sides with um, our, uh, step away from our allies and take sides with our enemies and embrace Russia openly. I mean, even if it's not pollution that's been uh, proven as of yet, because, you know, our, our, our investigation is still ongoing. You can't say this, stand there and say that it's laughable and that you think that the media um, tries to give this president a pass or, or, that, or that conservatives don't get a pass. Conservatives do definitely get a pass. I mean, you have a president who openly talked about sexually assault and won, won his election. I mean, what do you mean that, that conservatives don't get a pass? Hey, this, this is the era of double down. All President Trump has to do is double down on his proven lies and and... And, and, and lack of facts, and, and he can get away with anything. It's absolutely bizarre, and we can't do that anymore. We don't have the Richard, uh, we don't have the Nixon Republicans in office anymore because those Republicans, even well, though they let me, might let, not let, have let, let me bring in, let me bring in John Zogby on this. When it was time to talk. John Zogby, let me ask you, just if we take a step back here, do people just view politics as a whole differently? Maybe more as, I don't know, entertainment than, than it used to be. Oh, there's been a crossover between entertainment and celebrity and politics, to, to be sure. There's also a, a growing sense, we see it across the board, that, that everything is broken. I mean, it's, it's not just the political parties and government, but that all of our familiar institutions, the church, for example, are broken. And that's particularly what's going on in, in Brazil that we're looking at at, at the moment. But... In the United States, I mean, the antidote to all of this are millennials who are no longer just this interesting, intriguing group of young people. They're about 40 percent of the total vote. And we want to see what direction millennials are, are going to head into. If they turn out to vote in, in 2018, um, they probably are not going to vote uh, uh, a Republican. Um, and, but millennials will demand solutions and millennials are going to demand different modes of making decisions more that, that are more consensus-based and situational 
not hardened ideologically. And in many ways, you know, the, 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 that demographic was ushered into politics with Barack Obama in 2008. They were disillusioned, disappointed to some degree. They now have their anti-millennial, as they would perceive it, and the president of the United States. But the Democrats have an awful lot to prove to them, and I'm not so sure that they're up to it. I think it'll take millennials actually getting into uh, office and getting out actually in the streets or, or uh, via social media. This is kind of John. John, this is this is what's slightly confounding for people watching outside the United States. When there was that shooting in Florida last year, there was this nonpartisan effort to get pe young people registered to vote on that single issue, as you mentioned. In this case, it was it was gun control, and uh, it, it doesn't seem like uh, yes. there there's that much traction from it. Oh, I think actually if you drill down, you see a lot of traction to it. You see a lot of high school seniors and, uh, and uh, 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 community college students uh, and uh, organizing efforts online to get young people to register to vote, and they are. You're still battling among those young people a disillusionment like we want something done. Something wasn't done immediately. Who, do I really trust anyone? But they at least have registered to vote. Now we've got to watch the test is two weeks from tomorrow. Will they actually turn out to vote? If they do, they're not going to vote, turn out to vote. They're not going to vote Republican, I can tell you. Jay Chabria? <laughs> look, here's the thing. Are they going to vote? This is a really interesting question John brings up. And we always look to young voters to say, are they going to come out? Um, and Look, there was a Taylor Swift effect here of a lot of them registering to vote this last election, but I will see it when I believe it, that they're going to actually come out and impact an off-year election. I'm not certain about it, uh, but certainly they've got lots of ideas. We'll see. Yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned Taylor Swift, who endorsed a, d a Democratic candidate, I believe, in Tennessee. Uh, right. D d does that – what does it take to get young people to the polls? Well, that's the question. From my perspective, I mean, they only come to the polls during a presidential year when something, uh, when when they feel something really big. Now, that could change this year, and this because this, we could be in the precipice of young people actually coming out in a midterm election because either they have uh, discussed with what they're seeing in D.C. But I, again, I'm going to see when I believe it. Uh, see when you believe it, um, James Cohen. Tell us about your students. My students. Do they are are they less engaged than their elders when it comes to politics? Well, my students are mostly French and from other countries, and so uh, I don't speak to them too much about French politics because what I'm called upon to teach has to do with questions of race, ethnicity, and migration in the United States and United States is, and its relations with um, But do you, with, sense with Latin over, do you sense over time that oh, a, but, the but view I, by younger people towards politics in general is changing? I do believe that's the case because I have read polls before uh, that I'm sure Mr. Zobi is aware of, which uh, uh, indicate that there's growing. Uh, since, since, since the last major recession, there is growing um, mistrust among younger people about capitalism itself and more openness to ideas which go, uh, shall we say, beyond capitalism and start to define what a, 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 a post-capitalist or social society might, might look like. I, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not inventing too much here because uh, Bernie Sanders had a, a magnificent performance in the last 2016 primaries, and there's a movement which has grown around that, and many of his candidates will be present in the, in the coming race, and, and there is that wing of the Democratic Party, which may serve to help give some energy and to help galvanize uh, the party. That's a, a, that's a long shot, but it's starting to happen. All right. So the, 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 the hope, John Zogby, for, for those people is, is, is more, uh, more to the left. So more to the right on one side and more to the left on the other. John Zogby? That, that is correct. But here, here, is, here is what is going on. What happened at the Parkland uh, School in Miami, uh, Florida, um, was tantamount to this age of young people as Pearl Harbor was the attack on the United States in 1941 was to that group of young people. It has motivated them. It has mobilized them. It has made them pay attention. And in two weeks, we have our very first test. Does all of that mean that they actually see that a vote matters and a vote counts, but they are changed forever. And if it doesn't? 
And if it doesn't, then uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans get another lease for the next two years. But I don't think the next two years, I'm not so sure uh, I mean, if, if the, uh, I, I'm not so sure Donald Trump can be defeated as things are going today uh, in 2020. But I think it's only temporary. It all depends on uh, how long temporary means. In the 2016 election, John Sogby, we had one side that was doing polling, it seemed, while the other side was doing data mining. I know it's not as sh schematic as that. Uh, the truth is probably more uh, is more nuanced. But but it, that's that's the the impression in any case. When you see with two weeks to go, uh, the Democrats set to win the House, the Republicans set to keep the Senate. Uh, what do you think? I'm not so sure that the Democrats take the House. Um, it's not just simply a question of young people turning out to vote uh, and, and non-whites turning out to vote. It's a question of their turning out to vote in the right districts. I mean, they can turn out in big cities, they can turn out you know, in, in, in suburban areas, but they've got to turn out in, in actual battleground congressional districts. That remains to be seen. Democrats have to have a 69% turnout in the key swing districts, and we'll see. I, uh, I, I'm not ready to take out my blue crayon and color the House of Representatives as, as turning blue. I think it's going to be very close. Jay Chabria, what's turnout looking like in Ohio? Well, I think turnout's going to be pretty high, and, but I tend to agree with John. I think this is going to be a close election. I believe that the Democrats will take it. But here's, here's what I would say to this. This is completely unknown in terms of a lot of these districts. What's going to happen and what's going to motivate those key voters, especially suburban women? Democrats, are all, their enthusiasm is already off the charts. They're going to come out, we know that. But there are some ta there are tactics being employed by the public right now, either messaging or get out the vote-wise, to get their base up. And that could mitigate losses in the House and maybe even keep it for them. So in, in the state of Ohio, I think Democrats are looking good at the enthusiasm, but I think that Republicans are ready to make a little bit of a charge here at the end the last couple weeks. Antonio Ariano, uh, what, which way is the momentum swinging? Uh, you, you told us earlier about all the doors you've been knocking on there in Texas. We've been doing a lot of work, and we hope that uh, Latinos come out in, 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 a, in, in an, uh, an on, like, I mean, they come out for, for, for this election. It's, it's imperative. We know, we believe that this election will determine a lot. And so a lot is riding on it. And we want to make sure that all everybody has a, uh, a seat at the table and all voices are respected and represented. So I, I have actually been getting um, reports from earlier today, because as you mentioned, early voting starts today in, in, in Harris County, which is where I'm at, in Houston, Texas. So from the early reports that are coming in, there is a significant amount of increase in early voters, even from the 2016 election. They have seen that even this morning, there was lines at early voting polls and locations. People are eager to come out and cast their ballots, and we'll see how, how it plays out. <laughs> All right, we will indeed, and we'll be covering it here on France 24. I want to thank you, Antonio Ariano, for joining us uh, from Houston. Jay Chabria in Columbus, Ohio. John Zogby thank you. in Utica, New York. James Cohen for being with us. And thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.